this was going to be a nice, fun, light-hearted video where I systematically rank every historically set episode of Doctor Who on one of those nice little tier lists to determine the costume accuracy, but the more I watched, the further I slid into an existential spiral about the nature of time travel and the futility of trying to costume a story in which historical accuracy is theoretically an integral essential to the narrative itself, despite being completely unachievable even under normal time circumstances. So fasten your seatbelts because we are going into warp drive on how this show handles the challenge of costuming effectively every time and place in the universe. Time travel makes my head hurt for a whole host of narrative reasons, but not least in the costume department, because theoretically the story is claiming to depict what this actual time period would have looked like in actual reality. In order to accurately represent this, a painstaking level of detail needs to be put into every nuance of the costumes, set and prop design, sound design, language, mannerisms, habits, etc. Much of which we simply don't have enough surviving evidence, not just of these elements themselves, but of the personal and social context in which they existed. Which makes a perfect historical reconstruction impossible. Many period films and shows do an admirable job of presenting an evidence-based conjecture of what certain scenes might have looked like in the past, but this requires a perfect storm of designer knowledge and dedication to the research, a collaborative creative team, knowledgeable cutters and stitchers, willing actors, and of course, the time and money to make it all happen. In the case of Doctor Who, not only do we have historical locations populated by whole societies of people, some of which are actual named historical figures for whom we have actual pictorial evidence, but we also have time travelers who have to passably adapt to these periods. It's stated in the show that the TARDIS contains a wardrobe department, theoretically of extant items that the Doctor may have picked up in their original time periods. The idea, though, that the Doctor would happen to have situationally appropriate items from every decade in human and alien history in every potential companion size is realistically unfathomable. <laughs> So a bit of canonical inaccuracy in the companion dress would actually be believable if the story didn't also give us other methods of in-world disguise. In the Series 8 episode, Time Heist, the genetic shape-shifting character Sabra mentions that she emulates clothing through holograms, since a person's clothes are not part of their genetic makeup. The Doctor and Clara use some sort of clothing mind projection thing in the Series 7 Christmas special, so the technology to instantaneously create any clothing imaginable does exist in multiple different solutions. This, unfortunately, puts the costume department in a uniquely impossible position of having effectively no excuse not to dress everyone 100% historically accurately in order to be realistic to the world of the story, and we can't forget that this is not just a show about historical time travel, but literally all of time, space, and fiction is up for grabs. None of the episodes, I would say, present a truly tis peak level of evidence-based hypothesis of what any given period might have looked like in real life. But neither are most of the costumes distractingly anachronistic. The objective of the show isn't to educate an audience on life in Elizabethan England or to biography Winston Churchill in a two-part special. The history is merely an essential component in depicting the vastness of time and space. What this show does have to do well is A, at the very least, not make the costumes so outrageously costumey that the viewer can't suspend the time travel belief, but ideally, B, build a visual language that allows for the realistic accommodation of the concessions that have to be made for budget. And of course, cast size, stunt doubling, and the ever-present challenge of Thai TV scheduling. I expect that the historical costumes would have to take a financial backseat to the sci-fi elements, since you can go to a costume hire house and hire out reasonably decent historical garments pre-made, which incidentally might explain why a lot of the late Victorian and Elizabethan dress in the show is actually reasonably decent. You can't exactly 
hire out the very specific styles of the High Council of Time Lords or the Cybermen or the Silurians. These would have to be designed and built from scratch, which is a decidedly larger time and money expense than what is required of a rental. But we do get to see the direct effects of budget and resource increases as the show gained popularity over the years. Take for example the very first historically set episode of the revival, Rose is not only dressed in something that is actually more steampunk slash early 2000s goth than anything even remotely Victorian. By series two, it seems like we're starting to see one really big historically set episode per series, with around three to four historical episodes per series up to series five, six in series six, and a whopping nine out of the 16 episodes in series seven. In terms of the costume design for the show though, I've broken this down into three essential categories. Earth's timeline in our reality, fictional species and extraterrestrial cultures. Finally, we have the time travelers, for whom the rules of dress defining the previous two categories may be in flux. So the first and arguably the most straightforward classification of character is the Earthlings, both past and present. For present day Earthlings, this basically means deciding what stores a person is likely to shop from and using those clothes to convey aspects of their personality, their style preferences, their economic means. When we first meet Rose, for example, we can tell almost instantly that she is a young woman with an eye for the fashion trends popular to the early 2000s. And despite her and her mother's tight economical circumstances, Rose presumably has access to the latest styles at a discount through her job at a department store. Her mother, Jackie Tyler, on the other hand, is dressed in, and I direct quote, bargain bucket stores in the high street and reduced to clear stuff, but in similar pinks and sparkles that Rose might wear, which is, of course, fitting with her character in that her style choices are a bit younger than her years. Kate Stewart, on the other hand, epitomizes her official leadership role as head of unified intelligence with her outfit choices, which at least on surface level appear perfectly professional. She's got the business casual blazers and the slacks that signify her as a figure of authority in a highly funded agency, but she manages a simplicity and ease of movement in her outfits by opting for flat shoes and non-restrictive tops, and she limits her accessorizing in a way that allows her to be prepared for even the most unexpected of alien emergencies. And of course, for another example, we have Dr. Eustatius Jericho's choice of earthy tweed blazers, waistcoats, and round horn-rimmed glasses, all of which he still wears fully layered and with nary a button or a tie loosened well into the wee hours of the night, which paints him as this enthusiastic academic, unwaveringly dedicated to his research. These are all small but essential aspects of character, which can be efficiently conveyed through first glance without having to spend additional time in the writing, thanks of course to the costume choices. The same philosophy of exhibiting character through idiosyncratic choices of dress is also applied in the historical contexts. The series three two-part special, Human Nature and Family of Blood, I think is one of the show's best efforts towards period dress, and I think really speaks to the show's design team in that they really are capable of going hard on period dress when time and budget allow, which they very likely did more for this episode since the period setting is such a central aspect of the plot itself. The Doctor has effectively set himself up as a school teacher at a boys' boarding school in 1913, wiping his own memory in an effort to hide himself from some aliens who are hunting him. It's kind of essential in this context that, as far as the audience and the Doctor can tell, we're really fully committing to 1913 visuals here. I particularly love the variety of starched collars we get to see, with the boys' uniforms seeming to require simple wingtip collars, which actually is extraordinarily formal, I think, for a boys' school even in this period. This does, alternatively, speak volumes to the nature of the school. It's prestigious and expensive enough for the school to apparently be able to employ specialty launderers who would have the skills to maintain these collars. We get to see a bit more class representation in the Series 11 episode, The Witchfinders, set in the early 17th century. We have King James I representing the royalty, we have Becca Savage, who is some level of nobility, and we have a bunch of Lancashire villagers who are devoid of the skirt supports, the silks, and the very expensive lace trimming seen on the aforementioned 
upper or class characters. We're able to gain a very quick visual sense of the class disparity between Becca Savage and the rest of the villagers, as well as therefore the level of power she is able to hold over them. But also technically within this category of Earthlings is a subsection of character who reside on Earth and who would have access only to Earth materials in their dress, but they are not necessarily human shaped. Madame Vastra and Strax, two non-human species living in Earth's 1890s, are excellent examples of this need to conform to societal expectations of dress whilst adapting their clothes to suit their non-human physical needs. Strax basically has the physique of a thumb, so his necklines all had to be altered to basically be as wide as his head. The whole suit looks a bit uncomfortable and clumsy. This is not at all the fault of the build team, but I think a very believable in-world feature of a potato-shaped alien attempting to dress in standard Victorian day wear, but likely having to make it all himself. Actually, I can see Strax taking great pleasure in needlework because this is like one of the few times he is allowed to repeatedly stab things. Madame Vastra, on the other hand, does have the advantage of being pretty much human-shaped, so her clothes don't need structural adaptation, at least in the way that Strax does, but she does need to hide her reptilian skin. So she's adopted the very socially acceptable for this period, morning attire, which I think is really clever. This involves non-reflective blacks and deep purples, which she wears, signifying deep or still moderately recent close family member mourning. This also allows her to get away with wearing a veil when going out in public and effectively signal to people to leave her alone and also to conceal her face. She's accessorizing with jet beads, which is sort of the main acceptable decoration for mourning in this period. Also, can we just give it up for the prosthetic on this because it is so utterly seamless and gorgeously done. I know nothing about prosthetics, but it looks so satisfying. If all of this sounds like already a lot for a costume department to deal with, we haven't even got to the complicated parts yet. So herein is where we enter the realm of effectively fantasy costuming or costuming fantastical groups of people whose cultures and dress practices and sometimes materials don't actually exist. Believable rules and logic surrounding the dress practices need to be fabricated from scratch and then strictly followed. Let's examine the Silurians first, although they're not technically extraterrestrial since they inhabited Earth 300 million years before humans, but they are a reptilian species that live deep underground in the show's present and so don't share any cultural dress practices with humans. They do seem to have some form of agricultural infrastructure, so plant-based textiles aren't completely out of the question, but the need to artificially reconstruct the surface conditions necessary to grow textile plants like flax and cotton, secondarily, presumably, to essential food crops could mean that these natural fiber garments are more costly and valuable than their synthetic or natively occurring materials. In the episode, it's mentioned that the humans have punctured their defense barriers at 21 kilometers underground, which, according to my consultant geologist, places them still within the Earth's crust, at least in their general region of Wales. The Silurians, therefore, could potentially have access to silicates and potentially also to petroleum deposits. This makes the possibility of polyester and spandex materials realistically accessible, and this seems to be what we see on most of the warrior Silurians. This white texturous material used on the scientist's lab coat, for example, could be actually a very plausible stand-in for asbestos cloth. This would make much more sense than him wearing a cotton or linen, according to this theory at least, which would be the equivalent of us making a lab coat out of pure silk velvet or something. But let's take a little trip through time and space now and visit the planet Gallifrey, which is inhabited by the Doctors and the Masters species of Time Lord. By all appearances, this is a very human appearing species, and so they do have the ability to wear clothes in a way that is familiar to us. But alas, we are not dealing with an Earth or even remotely Earth-like, it seems, environment. So where are the Gallifreyans getting their clothes? The first thing that I notice is that the Time Lords tend to wear a lot of red and to do a lot of metalwork. You'd think that this would be an odd choice with the planet itself being so red. Surely there is plenty of red producing pigments in the soil minerals or perhaps plants or animal life that would make red dyed garments easy to come by and therefore cheap. 
So how can we see red worn almost exclusively by the members of the High Council, but not by the doctor's family, who I'm sort of mentally placing as some sort of agricultural class of working Gallifreyan? <laughs> One thing that does appear consistent across the classes is the level of vibrancy in clothing. We do see some cool pale gray blues on some of the doctor's community, but these are pale unless they are a warmer or darker pigment. Nothing near the vibrancy that the High Council prefers. It seems that saturation in the form of how much and of what quality dye one is able to obtain over just availability might be the thing that dictates status in terms of color and quality of cloth. Then, of course, there is the affinity for metallics in dress along with the textiles themselves. Everything from the elaborate shoulder pieces integral to the High Council uniforms to armor-like pieces to even metalwork that details on the robes. Despite the warm toned filters and the bright red planet, nobody is treating this like a hot climate. In fact, everyone from the High Council in their multi-layered velvet-like robes to the doctor's community wrapped up in shawls and petticoats like they're enduring the English moors seem to signify that the climate on this planet is actually quite cool. It's curious, therefore, that the doctor arrives at the beginning of the Series 9 episode hell-bent and immediately takes his jacket off as if he's trekking through the high desert. I'm hypothesizing that there's a significant importance of layering in Gallifreyan culture. The doctor's community seem to have maybe two layers, some trousers and a shirt, a waistcoat, maybe a jacket, a skirt and an apron, maybe. But the high council are dressed. They have their base layer, be that trousers or armor or some sort of under tunic, and then they have over tunics, and then they have wide sashes and robes, and then the big shoulder piece. And their outer garments, unlike the rural Gallifreyans' humble shawls, are long. They are voluminous, and they are decorated and sweep the ground in a full show of, I am important. So the doctor arriving and immediately de-layering before meeting his community is a humble gesture meant to signify that he's coming home, that he belongs with these people and that this is where he fits in. To further back this point, the doctor makes a show of putting the jacket back on before he goes to talk to the high council members when they show up at his house. Now he needs to assert himself as superior in order to get them to listen to him. Even the Sisterhood of Karn, who are this religious cult, who seem to be Gallifrey adjacent, but see, oh my god, the actual Doctor Who, people who like know the entire first series and like all the books and please don't roast me. <laughs> they seem to follow similar rules, including adopting a veil as an additional layer and perhaps to convey their religious importance. So we've tackled the challenge of costuming human-shaped earthlings, non-human-shaped earthlings, and human-shaped aliens. But what about the non-human-shaped aliens? The creatures for which we have neither earth evidence or logic to go from, nor the fundamental human-shaped body to work with. For the most part, what I've seen for this category is that either the entire species is depicted in some sort of uniform, like for example the Sontarans, who are conveniently a race of war-oriented clones and so have very realistic in-world reason to all look exactly the same, or there are only small numbers of individuals. My mind immediately goes to the series one episode, The End of the World, which is set on a spaceship full of wealthy ambassadors of various species, meaning that they make their appearances in pairs or in very small groupings. So we're either costuming at a scale which only requires a single design, or costuming in ones or twos and which also doesn't require a big design load. <laughs> which brings us to the third costume classification, and that is the time travelers, the people who aren't costume-wise confined to a particular time period or location, but who are seen in various different scenarios throughout the show. Here we get to see some really interesting personal idiosyncrasies with who makes an effort to conform to certain periods versus who wears whatever they want, whenever they want. The companions, for example, seem to make significant effort to either clothe themselves in the dress of the period via the TARDIS wardrobe, when of course the trip is planned and they have time. Sometimes they'll end up meeting people or staying overnight in these periods and they'll be given period clothing to wear. And this is where we get into some potentially really sticky situations because in theory these garments would have to be as close to extant garments as physically possible in order to be realistic 
to the world of the story. The dress that Clara is given in series eight in the episode Deep Breath when she stays over with Jenny and Vastra is actually pretty good for the early 1890s. It's a bit bustly in the fashion of the 1880s, but plausible, of course, as something that could have existed lying around in a wardrobe for a few years before she borrowed it. But even within the companions, there is varying level of commitment to period accuracy. Donna, when she stays in Pompeii in the series four episode, The Fires of Pompeii, is much further from even a hypothesized depiction of ancient Roman reality, which I struggle to find an in-world justification for. There are, of course, occasions where the trip is unplanned or is so rushed that there isn't time to realistically be changing clothes to blend in, which is a handy choice, both realistic to the narrative and serves to save a bit of time and budget. The more seasoned time travelers, however, for the most part, seem to just wear whatever they want, regardless of the time period, unless they're on a long-term stay, which requires blending in. The doctor, for the most part, has their resolutely 21st century uniform, which is seldom swapped out for other periods, rarely, if ever, earlier in the series, although 12 and 13 do make some random effort to blend in on planned trips, which are at least intended to be fun, relaxing visits. 13 is a bit more idiosyncratic, making some effort in, say, the waistcoat department while still keeping her signature blue coat. I did read an interview with Ten's designer saying that he is generally wearing his brown suit for historical episodes and the blue suit for more futuristic circumstances, although this really isn't consistent and the slim cuts of both of these suits are still very distinctly early 2000s. Nine abjectly refuses to wear anything other than his signature leather jacket, and 11 is just kind of lightly history bounding in any given circumstance. But despite the small variations in character and personal style across three generations, one thing remains consistent. The doctor dresses how they want, regardless of the situation. Little ears, look at the little ears. <laughs> they have no business being this cute. We don't often encounter time agent Jack Harkness in historical circumstances, but when we first meet him in the series one episode, The Empty Child, he's posing as a World War II officer and is very much dressed the part. Considering Jack is actually a resident of the 51st century, it might actually be safe to assume that Jack is pro-period dress and that he commits to the bit with impeccable historical accuracy. The doctor's half-time lord wife, River Song, on the other hand, seems to vaguely try and make an effort, but there's always something about her clothes that is still subtly or blatantly <laughs> anachronistic. There's always something in the fit or the material or especially her cosmetic styling that keeps her whole look feeling distinctly modern. That is stylistically more appropriate to the 21st Earth century. In fitting with her character, River treats her adventures like a chance to dress up and have a bit of fun. The period in question coming second or, I don't know, like fifth to her own personal comfort and tastes. And then there is the master. No, but listen, this little alien creature who just insists on history bounding a human Edwardian, regardless of time, place or body, purely because he feels like it, with the exception of his brief grunge phase, but honestly still slay. Name me a more relatable character, I will wait. Why is Professor Yana wearing his little 19th century shirt and waistcoat on a planet at the end of the universe a hundred trillion years in the future? Do not mistake this as a criticism, by the way. This is in fact, in my own biased opinion, the most realistic character choice in the entire series, and I am a fan. In the master's obsession with and constant pursuit of the doctor, it would make sense that they'd consciously or unconsciously emulate some of the Doctor's styles. Especially when we get to Missy, where a huge part of her character arc is firstly getting his attention in the most spectacular way just to give him a birthday present. With the exception of the O-Master assuming the role of Rasputin in 1917, there's otherwise no reason for him to be repeatedly showing up all over the universe in this one specific period of one planet's timeline of dress. She has a couple of distinctly different head looks throughout her appearances, most of which are decidedly not Edwardian. We first meet her in the 1890s, sort of, and this look is suitably late Victorian, the hair at least. The makeup is a little bit 
heavy, but this makes sense for when we meet her next in the 21st century. This look during the execution is wildly 1960s, or like Edwardian does 1960s, so I can only hypothesize that whatever landed her here was taking place at some point during that period. Then we get to her Volt era, where her only companion is Mad Professor Capaldi and his hair. Her hair has an equal mind of its own at this point, and this all culminates harmoniously with her attempt at Doctor Who cosplay in the Series 10 finale. Hello. I'm Doctor Who. How do you look at these things and not think they're just the cutest things in the world? They need to be stopped. <laughs> Doctor Who is a really interesting show to watch from a costume perspective. Although it is a show about time travelers, it isn't actually about the historical people in the portraits or the big events, both past and hypothetical future. It's really just a show about some alien who stole a sentient space traveling go-kart to traipse across the universe with little more than a half-formed plan and a magic screwdriver. It's about the intersection of the familiar aspects of humanity with all the endless possibilities of the unknown, and the essential job of the clothes in this circumstance is to provide a clean, recognizable contrast between people, between times, between species, between planets. Fundamentally, this show is an exploration of life and friendship and morality, and the reality we're forced to face that there are so many billions of tiny moments that have gone unrecorded beyond just the historical evidence of the clothes that people wore, all of which eventually will be lost to time. Ladies and gentlemen, this is your captain speaking, here to tell you about NordVPN, who are sponsoring our journey today. NordVPN is the fastest virtual private network service on planet Earth, striving to keep the internet safe from threats, censorship, and surveillance. Think of a VPN like your own personal TARDIS, allowing you to traverse the unknowns of cyberspace in your own personal protection bubble against cookie-hungry black holes and data-thieving Daleks. By masking your device's real IP address and selecting a new server in any of Nord's available regions around the world, you'll gain access to a whole host of new content that might otherwise be geo-blocked in your location. But NordVPN is more than just a VPN. With added privacy protections like password management and dark web monitoring, you're able to make sure that your online accounts are kept secure and stay aware of data leakages that might put your personal information at risk. Get the exclusive deal at nordvpn.com slash Bernadette. It is risk-free with Nord's 30-day money-back guarantee. And now, I gotta run. Don't forget to like this video if you liked, subscribe for more of my time-traveling antics, and say something nice in the comments. Come on, Handles. Let's go!